We are back, you are chatting with John P. Today we are going to be talking about vintage watches. I started this channel some time back with the whole idea we would be talking about vintage watches all of the time. But here's the thing guys, in the history of watches, there are only so many vintage watches. So I've been sprinkling in other things, but for you vintage guys, myself included, we're talking vintage. We're going to be talking about a big vintage watch auction that's happening in Geneva on November 9th. I'll talk about it here in a second, but first I'd like to thank you for coming back for another episode. Do not forget to hit the thumbs up button, like and subscribe. It does help me and leave in the comments below things you'd like to see in the future because I do incorporate them in base videos that I create for you um, from the comment section. So please do that if there's anything that you'd like to see. And of course, you can find me on Instagram, the real John P where you can see different things that are going on here at Delray watch as well as a little bit of my life and some other things. So check that out on my wrist today. I have a white gold H Moser Mayu. Um, one of the uh, older versions of this watch. I, I just added this to my collection. I'll be doing another video about this in the very short, uh, in the short or near future rather. And I think you probably will enjoy that video. So stay tuned. So vintage watches, auctions, Newman Daytonas, the whole thing, right? Vintage watches have been climbing in price. The popularity is increasing in this segment of the watch community. People are starting to get into this as more of a hobby, less of a utility item. This is something we know, especially if you're a watch guy. But these auctions, you know, the, the auction, the hammer prices on some of these watch auctions are really climbing up there into the millions, you know, with the Newman Daytona and some of the others out there. So, of course, we have another iteration of this long, drawn-out saga of Rolex, basically Rolex and Paddock watch auctions. And on November 9th, they're having one in Geneva. It's run by Philips. And the whole theme around this is double-signed watches. Now, if you're not familiar with a double-signed watch, essentially what it is is you have a watch produced by the brand, so Rolex or Patek or, or Omega also did this as well, or Cartier, any of the others, and they have the logo or the signature of a, a retailer usually on it. So for example, Tiffany, Tiffany Rolex, the Tiffany name will be on the dial, Tiffany Patek, and they still do this today. You can go to a, a Tiffany store and they have a Patek boutique inside the store and you can actually you know, get a Patek watch with the Tiffany name on it. So there's some others like a Bailey Banks and Biddle, Serpico e Laino. I know I butchered that. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. Uh, but, you know, they um, they were f in parts of Latin America. They were an authorized dealer for, for quite some time. They were stamping watches, Rolex, um, Gubelin, and also Hausman. So in this auction, you're going to be seeing a lot of double-signed watches, which in recent times have been commanding really high prices. Almost 20%, I think the stat is, almost 20% of these record-breaking million dollar and up watches that go to that complete their auction, the hammer price over a million dollars, are actually double signed. Now that might be changing a little bit, and I think it's going to be going up after this auction, but I have two specific examples I'd like to show you here, and then I want to tell you or kind of talk about where these watches are being sourced because it seems like these things are coming out of the woodwork every day. Oh, I have this crazy Daytona. I have this, this double sign, this and that. You know what I mean? These are coming out of the woodwork. And where were these? I'm going to tell you where these were coming from or where these are coming from. But let's look at two specific examples. So first we have a pink gold Patek 533 retailed by Hausman, of course, double sign. Now this is a dual register chronograph, so it has two subdials on it. Um, essentially, they produced a few hundred of this reference number, but they had the same reference number at this time for the gold models and the other metals. And in pink gold, it's rumored to, uh, um, to only have a few of them in circulation. So that's what makes this model or this version of this model incredibly rare. And when we talk about high prices at the auction, high hammer prices, you know, the sale price of the watch, you know, the more specific and the more rare and the subtleties that kind of add up and create a very unique package and almost a work of art is what drives up these prices. So when we have a, something like this, Patek Pink Gold 
chronograph a 533, I really think that the sticker price or the sale price on this one is going to be very high, especially considering there's only so many of these out there. Paddock is very hot right now. Chronographs are still in. And the fact that precious metals I see coming back a little bit just because of what the rest of the market is doing in terms of stainless steel and the shortage of stainless steel, even though stainless steel is uh, one of the most common metals in the entire world, there seems to be a little bit of a resurgence and kind of more interest back into the precious metals. So I think this one is going to be one to watch. So next, I want to show you this gold 6241 Rolex Daytona Newman. Now it has, uh, you know, the John Player dial. So it's a special type of dial. There'll be a picture here. You can see it. It's very distinct in its look. With this specific layout and configuration, there are only 12 known examples of this floating around. And when we're talking about Newman dial, vintage Daytonas, vintage Rolex chronographs, considering there's 12 of these floating around and people know this and you have someone like Phillips basically co-signing that saying, yes, this is the case. And considering this is a Tiffany dial as well for the whole double signed theme of this auction, this is going to be absolutely through the roof. Um, many, you know, auction specialists are kind of estimating this to go over one, th uh, 1 million US dollars. And when we're talking about, you know, uh, a head only uh, Daytona that retailed for probably close to nothing comparatively to what Daytonas are being sold for today, it's really astounding to think about it. Now there's endless videos about it. So I don't have to keep telling you uh, about how rare these things are for you to know that this is going to be a very high sale price, but it's something to look at. I think it's a very cool and interesting dial layout. The combination really speaks to me. What do you think about this specific watch? Leave in the comments below. I'd love to hear your opinions. Also, if you don't buy into this crazy vintage Daytona um, auction house craze, le leave in the comments below as well. I want to hear both sides of the fence. By the way, I want to kind of shed some light on these dials and the possibility for them being actually signed. Now there's many specialists that can analyze these dials. They can compare them to known good examples of barn finds, which I'll, I'll talk about in a second. So there are some specialists, but it's something to consider that when you buy one of these watches at auction, it's really kind of at the buyer's risk. Now, when we're talking about very rare things, even in the art world, things are sometimes manipulated. Things are kind of put together. And it's something to consider that while someone will be spending perhaps over a million US dollars on this vintage Daytona, th there is some consideration the buyer needs to really be liquid enough to take a bit of a hit in case there's something a little bit wrong. Now, that being said, there have been people that have opened up, you know, um, little uh, complaints with some of the auction houses, but for the most part, they do a great job. But it's something to consider that if you're getting into some of these watches when we're talking about absolutely the rarest of the rare, there is a little bit of margin there for something to not be totally correct or as described. So something to keep in mind, not talking bad about the auction houses, but that is usually um, a consideration when purchasing something this rare of, of literally any type of uh, product, including art. So I mentioned the word barn find. Now I want to throw this in there as well. You know, these watches seem to kind of just be f almost flooding, but at a very slow pace, right? They're, they kind of just keep appearing on the market, right? Here's a new auction. All these vintage Daytonas, so rare. All these vintage paddocks, so rare. And they keep just kind of trickling in, right? It's almost suspicious. And people ask me all the time, where are these watches coming from? And I'll kind of shed some light onto where some of these watches are coming from, because I, I think that when, when some people out there that have been in the watch industry a long time, maybe even they were alive when some of these watches originally were circulating as just everyday wares, um, you know, they kind of catch on to some of these things. Here's the thing, you know, with some of these really rare watches, there are people out there, individuals, dealers, pseudo dealers, not necessarily anyone in the pre-owned space, but usually private parties across the entire world that are sitting on some of these watches. And how it works is there's people out there that will travel the entire world and they'll 
go to cities where they know there's, you know, a lot of antiques, there's a lot of collectors, there's a lot of, you know, there's a higher increased potential using information they know and their networks of individuals in the watch community of where they think there's a decent chance at finding some of these rarer watches. Now, when some of these watches that we talk about, some of these double-signed watches, especially when we get into Bailey Banks and Biddle, Serpico Ilaino, Gubelin, Hausman, things like that, you know, they're from specific parts of the world where you could only really buy that watch from this authorized dealer or retailer at a certain period of time. And so you're not going to find, you know, a Serpico Ilaino watch laying in someone's safe in the middle of Missouri, for example. Like, it, it could happen, but it just wouldn't make any sense. So... People travel, individuals travel the world, they make connections with these uh, collectors or, like I said, other people kind of in the trade, not in the trade, and they buy these things and sometimes they keep them in their safe and they wait a while until there's a better moment to take it to auction or perhaps they find a barn find. Now, a barn find would be someone basically that had one of these watches or something similar, something rare. It doesn't even have to be rare, but basically a watch that's virtually untouched, um, for the most part, to be truly a barn find, and it perhaps it comes with box, papers, the whole kit, and it's sitting in someone's safe or a drawer for the longest time. They forgot about it, and oh, I found my great grandfather's watch, and no, uh, oh, it's this very rare paddock reference, things like that. And then someone says, "Hey, I'll give you, you know, this for it," and then that person might put it up for sale themselves on the internet, or they might take it to another dealer, or if they are a dealer, they'll take it to an auction house. Now, the auction house, they they try to kind of have some type of theme. If they can put a theme behind it, it attracts pools of buyers and it becomes almost an event, right? They can get a lot more media attention. So something like a double signed auction that they're having, um, it really attracts people that are into that. And it's, it's almost a guarantee for those that are buying these types of watches and other items that there's going to be some good stuff there for them. You know, if they just had another Phillips auction, it wouldn't really mean anything. But if they're having an auction with all these watches that they've collected um, from these individual dealers or sellers, wherever they've actually gotten these watches from, it just means a whole lot more to everyone involved. The sale prices are going to be higher because there's there's a lot of synergy between these watches. Perhaps if you're a high-end collector and you're into Tiffany, well, you're going to show up, but also so is someone that's interested in the Gublin. And maybe in that process, you kind of get interested in the other watch. And, you know, the, the, the hammer prices are going to go up on some of the brands or some of the, the double signed uh, co-signers here. And it might cause some of the others to go up as well. So there becomes a lot of synergy. It becomes more of an event. And it's something more to look at and attract more buyers, different buyers, and kind of cross over in what people are interested in, right? Because when you're talking about things of this nature, there's, there's a lot of times people cross over, they change, they get interested in this and that. And so it's, it really works out in <laughs> ultimately the auction house's favor and the sellers, but um, not always in the favor of the buyer. But when you're buying a million dollar watch, does it really matter if they get an extra 10%? I don't know. Leave in the comments below. So what do you guys think? Does this all make sense to you? Maybe you're not into vintage. Maybe you are into vintage. Leave in the comments below. Again, if you're into vintage, do you buy into this vintage craze? Do you not? Love to hear your thoughts and opinions. It's Friday here, gearing up for the weekend. Let's all have a great weekend and we'll see you uh, on the next video Monday. Thanks for watching. You have been chatting with John P. Ciao.